Matthew chapter 12, <clears throat> verses 15 through 21. This morning's theme is servant, and capital S, because it is the word that describes Jesus Christ, that he is a servant. He was a servant, he is a servant, and he will always be a servant. Even today, as he sits upon the throne, he is serving us, is he not? When you pray, when you need help, when there's difficulties, you call out to him, and he's serving you by helping you, by guiding you, by delivering you. And so he is a servant, uh, by all means. In this chapter, though it is a short and brief passage, and it's not a whole lot there, Matthew identifies Jesus as the servant of the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 42. Jesus was a servant back then, as he is today. And Isaiah describes him as a servant. He describes Jesus in his ministry and literally his heart towards people. And I hope that this morning you can see that heart that Jesus has towards you. Um, not man's heart. Uh, I hope you're not looking at man. And, and I say that periodically, and it's just amazing. Uh, all of a sudden someone's upset or someone's gossiping or someone's saying things, and, and, and you're going... They're looking at man, and they're not looking at God. I've said it over and over again. Stop looking at men. Look at Jesus Christ. He is a servant, and he is your Lord, and he is your Savior. You're to look to him. You're to not trust in man. You're not, you're not to lift men up. You are not to put them on a pedestal because they will always fail you. But Jesus will never fail you. Now, what is a servant? The basic term for servant covers a range, a range of meanings. Uh, in our society, when we think of servant, we think of slavery back in the 1700s with the African Americans, uh, Africans who were brought here by a lot of Muslims and their own native tribe members, delivering them to America, to Britain and London and so forth. And we, we always think of that. Or, or maybe you think of a servant who comes and cleans your house, you know, or a servant that washes your car, or a servant that mows your lawn. Uh, there are servants in kingdoms uh, that serve kings. There are servants in the White House that are serving there. So it, it all depends on the context uh, that you're speaking in as to what a servant is. It's used like over 800 times in the Old Testament alone. And it does refer to slavery. But here, here in these few passages, it's speaking of Jesus Christ as the servant of God the Father. That he is his servant. And that he is doing everything that the Father asks him to do. He serves with his life. From the day that he was born until the day that he dies and the day that he's on that throne in heaven he is serving the will of the father and so he serves with his life and we see it at the cross every time we look to the cross we see what true servants do and that is they die for others and you and i are servants of god also you and i are servants of god also we serve him now how do we serve him well it all depends because some of you serve him in different ways than others because God has given us gifts that vary and those gifts that you have are to be used for his service um, not to look at someone else and see what gift they have and how they're serving that's wonderful you should be rejoicing and praising God for that but what gifts has God given you and how are you serving well I'm not a servant in the church I, I don't know really what to do in the church well we can have you just open up we can have you move cones. Uh, that's a service. Well, I really don't like doing that. I'm not a people's person. Well, maybe you can serve at home. Maybe you can get on the phone and just call real quick and say, hey, uh, we're voting against this SB 1146. We don't like it. That's being a servant for the kingdom of God. Maybe it's just supporting. Uh, I, have, I know people, personal people that are very wealthy, and they believe that their service to the church is to make money. And then they support the church uh, by giving that money uh, to the Lord. And this is above their tithe and offerings. Uh, that's their service. So service is a lot. You can be serving as a mother. 
and then you host a mommy and me class for other mothers so that they can learn how to be good mothers. Uh, that's a service to the body of Christ. So it all depends on the context, but we are all servants. So let's read this text, 15 to 21, so that we get the context of what Matthew is speaking of here. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there and great multitudes followed him and he healed them all. Yet he warned them not to make him known that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet saying, behold, my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will declare justice to the Gentiles or nations. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust, will trust. Matthew, out of all the other gospel, probably quotes Isaiah more than anyone else. As a matter of fact, quotes the Old Testament more than anyone else. The Old Testament speaks of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was speaking with the religious leaders, you know, he said to them, you read of the Old Testament, you, you read the scriptures, the Torah and the prophets and so forth, and yet you missed it completely because they speak of me. They speak of Jesus Christ. And if you read the Old Testament very clearly, you will find Jesus Christ in there all over the place. On Wednesday night as we're going through through Genesis, we we just saw a, a pre-incarnate of Jesus Christ, an angel of the Lord, which came to uh, Sarai's uh, maidservant, Hagar, and ministered to her. Uh, it was Jesus himself that ministered to this lady who was brokenhearted, who was in pain, who was suffering, who was pregnant with a nation that would deal with people, even to this day, in a negative way. They are the Muslim people, Islam. This is that nation. Yet God had mercy and grace upon Hagar and what she was going through. And so we see Jesus here as a servant. So let's go ahead and, and look at these verses a little closer. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there. So if we back up to verse 14, he withdrew from who and from what? We see in verse 14 that the Pharisees went and they plotted against him how they might destroy him. You know, again, the characteristic of, of people that want to destroy things um, is a negative one. Anytime we want to destroy people, anytime we want to gossip about people, anytime we tell lies about people, it's always a, in the negative and you're ne not necessarily working for God. You're actually working for the enemy. You really are. You have to be aware of that. And you have to be careful. These people were plotting against Jesus Christ. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to murder him. They did not like what he was doing. <coughs> he was changing the world. And they didn't like it because it was affecting them. We need to be careful that we're not like these religious people. Uh, Jesus knew of this plot that was against him. And so he avoided confrontation until the right time. The right time was what? At the crucifixion. It was at the crucifixion. So he withdrew himself from them. He didn't confront them, but he walked away from it. Oftentimes that's probably the best thing to do. I know Pastor Chuck has always said, don't defend yourself. It's kind of hard when people gossip about you uh, without you hearing the source. It's kind of hard when um, someone's saying bad things and, and you want to defend yourself, you know. And they don't know the story. They don't know all the details, but they think they do. Um, and you want to defend yourself, and you, and you don't. Uh, years ago, there was a church out in uh, Hemet area, Marietta, and they had a... <coughs> A staff member on their administration and he embezzled money he was embezzling money and the pastor he was just irate caught him um, thousands of dollars and he so badly wanted to throw him into prison uh, call the police on him and so forth and Chuck gave him advice and they 
basically with the intent of don't drag Jesus' name in a situation like that. Just let them go and let God deal with it. You just regather your church, get focused, get prayer. God will provide for you as he always has. That is not defending yourself. That's so hard to do when someone does something like that to your church. But you leave them to God, and God will take care of them. Jesus didn't confront them at this time. And it won't be until the crucifixion that he confronts them by his death on the cross, uh, where he would focus all his attention and strength, really. And I think that speaks loudly to the whole world, uh, that he died instead of confronting you. Matthew tells us that Jesus was aware of these plots. He tells us that Jesus knew uh, which may mean to come to know uh, what his adversaries were planning. Uh, Mark and Luke really never mention it at all, but Matthew doesn't give us how Jesus knew of these plots. It would have been obvious in the synagogue there that there were people who were opposed to Jesus, but here Matthew seems to be referring to the plot that they want to kill him because of verse 14. I'm sure that Jesus had many enemies besides the religious leaders. Uh, others, like when you look at the camp there uh, in the temple when they brought him to be um, judged in the middle of the night and witnesses stood up. You know, it wasn't the religious leaders. These were witnesses within the community that were affected by Jesus, and they were willing to lie against him. So here, Matthew, it seems to uh, refer to the religious leaders, though. Somehow Jesus came to know this plot. His reaction was to avoid confrontation. Uh, he would die courageously when the right time came, but he would not engage in a needless debate with his enemies until his ministry drew to its close. Now, it's important to, to say this while I said that. It doesn't mean that we are not to confront at all. Jesus is just not confronting them at this time. There will be a time when Jesus will stand up and he will speak against evil. He, and we should stand up and speak against evil too. Uh, he came not, though, to dispute with these proud men. Uh, you don't really see that too often. Once in a while, he will say some things. You read in Mark where he just comes up against you, brood of vipers. Right, He calls them a, a brood of viper, a bunch of little snakes, which are the most poisonous uh, of the group there. And he calls them out at those times. But here he doesn't. He withdraws himself. And it says that a great multitude followed him and he healed them all. Um, the question is, were these multitudes saved after that? It doesn't say. Uh, we do know when he fed the thousands that Jesus did make the comment that they're here for the food. They're not really here for me nor the gospel. Uh, they come because their needs are met. And, and you, you have a church this size or any size, and there's a certain percentage of the church where people really aren't there because they know God personally and they have an intimate relationship with him. Uh, sometimes they're seeking out other things. Maybe they're seeking out just help. I just want help out of my situation. Now, that's a way where God will get into their heart. It's the beginning but it shouldn't be the thing that keeps them in church. It should be their relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, they should be here because of him and because of what he has done for them with eternal life, right? We have to keep our eyes on the bigger picture, and that is eternal life, that we're one day going to die and our home is in heaven. But we sometimes keep our eyes on what's happening around us in the world. So we want Jesus to kind of like a genie in a bottle, just whenever I can, rub him and he's going to help me and deliver me. And, and that's not always the case. He allows us to grow through trials and tribulations. So were they all saved? Probably not. The world will not change till the disciples come and become those witnesses there uh, to Jerusalem, Judea, and all the rest of the world when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And really that's what we need is the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon us. We should be asking for the Holy Spirit every day that he come upon us and empower us to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Lord, help me. I want to love you. Empower me to desire your word, to pray, and to seek you. These are things that the Holy Spirit brings into our hearts 
so that we have the hunger and the desire to do so so that we can grow thereby and have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ and not be one that sits on the wayside and just comes in on a Sunday morning, sits through a sermon and says, yeah, okay, 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 and then leaves. And that's it. Goes back to his normal life. That's not what God wants. These people probably traveled hundreds of miles just to get help uh, from Jesus Christ. Look at verse 16. It says, yet he warned them not to make him known. The, the word warned there is, is literally a rebuke. Jesus warned them. Uh, it's a censor in a, in a sense. He's censoring them. I, I don't want to be known at this time. And so I'm warning you in order to prevent you from an action of bringing one to an end. And in, in a sense, is don't tell anybody what is happening right here at this time. I, I just kind of want to do this so that you see it personally, the power that I have, and that you come to know me in a personal way. But I don't want it to spread around. Why? Because Jesus did not desire publicity. He did not desire publicity. He didn't want his, his picture on a big billboard, right? He didn't want his name out there. He didn't, he didn't want to have his picture on TV and what God is doing through Jesus Christ and you know, didn't want it broadcast all over the place. He didn't want mailers going through the mails to all the homes and things. He didn't want all that publicity. He wanted to do his work, fulfill God's plan quietly, quietly. Obviously, the large crowd following him, <clears throat> you know, a certain amount of publicity would have to take place. People just aren't going to be quiet, and we see that throughout the scriptures. The man in the tomb there, you know, immediately he went back and told the whole city. Uh, that, that just happens. But he was not a public publicity seeker. And not because he would be in danger of his enemies, who would know where he was at, but because he preferred to do his work quietly without any fuss. It seems today many want crowds, fuss, and publicity, huh? Seems like they want their name brand. Um, they want their faces on pictures. Um, they want to be taking pictures with somebody. I personally don't like that stuff. I, I got a, 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 what they call it, like a post from Facebook uh, of an event that took place several years ago. Like I just got one this morning of our little dog, Snowball. And it was four years ago. I'm like, wow, we've had her now for four years. She's just a tiny little puppy. Well, I got one the other day, and it was with me and Pastor Chuck uh, in a picture. And then Greg Laurie, and then uh, Raul Reese, and some other guys uh, had gone to a pastor's conference. And that was about five years ago I took those pictures. Now, I took those pictures because people in the church were saying, when you go to the pastor's conference, get pictures with all the guys there. All the pastors, now they're talking about the ones with the big churches, right? That everybody wants to take pictures with. And I'm just like, I don't know. I don't, I just, you know, in all the years, I, I just don't like that stuff. I don't like going up there and taking pictures with, with people. And so, um, just not my nature. But everyone kept asking me, so I'm like, all right, I'm going to do it. So it, it, it took some strength for me to get up there. And, Pastor Chuck, do you mind if I take a picture with you, you know? And, oh, yeah, yeah, come over here. And he, you know, took a picture with me. You know, Greg Laurie, and in fact, with Greg Laurie, it was Steve Mays, I believe. I asked him, could you take a picture of us? And so he took my camera, and he goes, click. He goes, oh, it didn't come out very well. And then I, I, he showed it to me, and it was a picture of himself. He did a selfie. You know. So I posted that also. But people want that publicity. You know, here, look at, I'm with uh, Elvis Presley. I'm with uh, Obama, you know, and those things, because it makes them feel better. And that's not the reason that we should be doing things. We should be doing things for the glory of God. It should be for the glory of God. Now, we don't know a man's heart, and so hopefully as we do see people out there with, with uh, celebrities and so forth, and hopefully they're doing it for the glory of God and a possibility to preach the gospel to someone. We just don't know. Billy Graham has been a man that you see his picture all over the place with a lot of celebrities, and he has a heart to reach people with the gospel. Uh, Muhammad Ali just passed away. And I was reading an article that uh, Muhammad Ali's father brought him to Billy Graham because he was af afraid that Muhammad Ali was leaving the Christian faith for Islam. And so um, Billy Graham's there with a picture of Muhammad Ali and his father, you know, and so forth. 
so an opportunity to preach the gospel. Now, I kind of like just being in the in, in the background and, and just kept coming up here and preaching the gospel. Even Summerfest, you don't see me. What am I doing? What, what am I doing at the Summerfest? Anybody know? Collecting raffle tickets, right, for the kids. I love that. And they just come up and, a bike? Yeah, a bike, you know. Okay, write your name right here. And they write their first name. No, put your second name too. Do I put my address? No, don't worry about it. But you got to be here. You know, I love their faces. A BMX bike, you know. I'd rather be doing that than up there and doing what Roman does. You know, or, or the other guys worshiping and, and so forth, doing the emceeing. And I know he does it for the right reason, too. But that's my nature. I'm just not the type of guy that loves doing that stuff. I, I don't like it. But I love teaching the Word of God. So Jesus did not like all the fuss, all the publicity, all the crowds and so forth. And in fact, he always got away from them. Look at verse 17. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet. Now, the word Isaiah means salvation of the Lord, or Jehovah is helper. What a beautiful name uh, that God gave him, a helper of the Lord. From verses 18 through 21 are going to deal with Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 42. This is the longest quotation from the Old Testament scripture in the Gospel of Matthew. Isaiah was a Hebrew prophet of the 8th century BC. He exercised influence at the court of kings of Judah and took a big part in foreign policies. Called to the prophetic office in the year of King Uzziah's death in 740 uh, BC, he continued his work until the Assyrian invasion of Judah in 701 B.C. So he has a major uh, prophetic book in the Old Testament called the Book of Isaiah. It's a big book separated into several sections. In fact, the latter section of the book has been under scrutiny because it is so clear concerning the end time events, so precise that they said it had to have been written uh, way, way after which uh, is not true. Tradition tells us that his death uh, by martyrdom uh, was in the reign of Manasseh, 6 and 90. His name is mentioned 53 times in the New Testament. So he was an important prophet of the Old Testament, one that we should probably read. In chapters 40 through 66, uh, Isaiah deals with the redemption of Israel, the redemption as God is trying to pull them away from idolatry and bring them back into a relationship with him and also the mission to the world. Let's read Isaiah 42, 1 through 4 to get the context of what Matthew is quoting from. It says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. I will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. I will not cry out nor raise his voice nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands shall wait for his laws. And we know that Jesus did that when he went to the cross and he established justice, righteousness in this world. How? By his blood, not by your works, not by your good deeds. We are clothed by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That righteousness has been imputed to our account. So Matthew summarizes those verses here in verse 18 to 21. He says, behold, and that word behold there is emphatic again. So, so Matthew is saying, behold, reader. In other words, listen up. Listen to what I'm going to say. My servant in whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, upon him. One commentator, Bernard's, points out that the quotation presents us with an original reinterpretation of messianic authority. In popular expectations, kings exercised their authority by the opposition, but Jesus showed his authority in his concern for the helpless and downtrodden. What's that song that we sing? A king that would die for me, right? Normally, a king would oppose you. Normally, a king would demand you to bow before him. Normally, a king would demand taxes of you. But our king does none of that. Our king died for us. 
our king serves us. Our king washes our feet. You know the story in the Gospel of John, chapter 13. As Jesus gets on his knees, he puts his robe on there, his, his, his apron, and he begins to wash the feet of the disciples. And Peter was so embarrassed by the fact that his master and rabbi got on his knees to wash his feet. They said, Lord, Lord, no, no, not my feet, not my feet. You know, if I don't wash your feet, Peter, you'll have nothing. Okay, wash my whole body. No, just your feet's enough, Peter. I don't need to give you a whole bath. You know, you know that story. But the example of Jesus getting on his knees and serving his own disciples. I don't know how many times I've heard Chuck say the word minister, and he's speaking to pastors. The word minister means servant, guys. They're servants. I, I can remember hearing him say that several times. Senior pastors, your servants. Minister means serving. You should be serving the flock. You should be serving the flock. I love serving the flock. I love serving the flock. And, and not just this flock, other flocks. And here recently in the last several months, I've been counseling people not even going to this church. Uh, I've got another counseling gig <laughs> uh, with another couple. that, And these people all live out in Redland, San Bernardino area. So you're, you're to serve. My job as pastors, yes, and this is the excuse that most pastors use, well, I serve by teaching the Word of God. Yeah, that's a service, and that's an important service, and that's a gift that God has given you. Um, but there's more to service than that, too. Uh, cleaning. Uh, I think Chuck gave the perfect example. All the way to his death, you see him in that little cart, driving around, picking up paper. That's service from a senior pastor. And I love that about him and Romaine as they were servants. And so I try to set that example to the best of my ability. Uh, sometimes I fail. The king who would die for me. Isaiah's prophecies is making the point that God the Father is delighted in his servant, Jesus Christ. God said that he will put his spirit on his servant. Now, you kind of read that and you go, wait a minute, I thought Jesus was God. Why does he need the Spirit? He needs the Spirit. We all need the Spirit. Why do you think we argue and fight? Why do you think we get into uh, situations and, and we can't get Because we need the Spirit of God every day. Just talking with a guy and, uh, about anger and says, what you need to do is pray. As soon as you start getting angry, pray. Say, Lord, I shouldn't be angry. I need to take this anger away. Uh, you need to give me power. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and then give me a scripture so I can memorize and get my mind off of it. We need the Spirit of God. Did Jesus need the Spirit of God? No, he's God, but he was filled with the Spirit. He was filled with the Spirit. And a true Christian will be filled with the Spirit. Let me read to you what A.W. Tozer wrote. He said, a real Christian, a real Christian is an odd number anyway. A real Christian is an odd, in other words, he's an oddball. That's what he's saying. He's an oddball. He's strange. He said, he feels supreme love for one whom he has never seen. And he has this sense of God's presence that's there. I, I sense him right now. I don't know if you do, but he's here. And he's in this place. And he's ministering to my heart right now. And I know to some of you. But there's a presence about him, though we've never seen him. He says, talks familiarly every day to someone he cannot see, expects to go to heaven on the virtue of another, empties himself in order to be full. A Christian is one who says, get rid of me, God. Get rid of my anger, get rid of my frustrations, get rid of my gossiping, get rid of my lying, get rid of my cheating, Lord, get rid of my, get rid of that stuff, Lord. I don't want it in my life and then fill me with you. That's what a true Christian does. He admits he is wrong so he can be declared right, goes down in order to get up, is strongest when he is weak, admits when he is wrong. Uh, that's a true Christian, one who walks every day, man, I've sinned, Lord, forgive me. And then you sin again, forgive me, Lord, forgive me so I can be right before you. One who pushes himself down so that God would lift him up. One that realizes, Lord, when I am weak, you are strong, you are strong. You know, I'm a proud man. 
I'm a very proud man. And I admit that to you. And before my accident eight years ago, I could do everything that was necessary to keep this church running. I didn't need anyone. I didn't need Randy. I don't need a sound guy. I don't, I don't need someone to clean the yard for me. I don't need to, I'll do it myself. I'll do it myself. And God had to humble me. So when I got hurt, I realized that God didn't want me to do it myself. He didn't want me to do it my way. He wanted to do it his way. And so I lay in bed watching everybody else do it. And he said, you need to leave it alone. I don't need you to be doing everything. And it was a lesson that was learned by being hurt and unable to do anything. So at my weakest point, he made this church strong because people stood up. The Randys and the Freds and the Romans and the leadership here and those who serve, the Marthas in the back and so forth that are serving here. They made this ministry strong through the Spirit of God. At our weakness, at our weakest, God becomes strong. A Christian is rich when he is poorest and happiest when he feels worse. He dies so he can live forsakes in order to have give always so he can keep sees the invisible hears the inaudible and knows that which passes knowledge aw tozer the root of righteousness that is truly a christian of god if you don't relate to any of those things i hope that you'll respond at the end of this message and ask jesus christ into your heart in a fresh and a new way, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. He is a king that died for us. A servant of God needs to be filled with the Spirit of God in order to be good with the work of God. We need the Spirit of God. And as I said earlier this morning, I want all the servants in this church, whether you're in the children's ministry, cooking, or ushers, I want you here 15 minutes before we start. I want you here, and I want to pray right here at the altar before the Lord. We need the Spirit of God to do what we do. For his glory. You cannot do it in the flesh. If you're doing it in the flesh, I'll tell you how you know you're doing it in the flesh, because you're getting tired of it. If you're getting tired, like, oh, I gotta go to church, and you're rushing, oh, it's because you're doing it in the flesh. If you're not looking forward to coming to church and serving God, you're doing it in the flesh. We need the Spirit of God. And so I want everyone here 15 minutes before we start, and I want to pray and ask the Lord to bless us as a body of Christ and to be in unity. And so I hope you'll do that. This will enable us to prepare the body of Christ for the work of the ministry and to preach the gospel to all the nations. So Matthew goes on and says, He shall declare justice to the Gentiles. And, and some of the commentaries, uh, the word Gentiles in the Greek that literally means nations. So not just the, the Jewish church, but also the Gentile nations, a, a combination in the early church that took place there. Verse 19, He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the street. So part of the prophetic word in Isaiah of the Messiah is, and Jesus fits this completely, that he's not going to quarrel or cry out, nor anyone will hear him out in the middle of the street. Uh, the Lord is not going to face them with a direct confrontation. He will not quarrel with them. That's not his mission. He does not, of course, mean that he will not oppose evil, because he will, but affirms a strong term that he will not try to impose his will on everybody. Uh, we need to be careful not to impose our will on everyone else. And when we're preaching the gospel, you can't force someone to come to the Lord. If you can force them into the kingdom, someone can force them out of the kingdom. It has to be a spirit move thing. God has to get a hold of their hearts. You can share the gospel with him. You know, you can share your testimony with him, but it's up to them. It's their choice. That's like casting your pearls before the swines. They just don't want it. And if they don't want it, you can't force it on them. So you walk away. You walk away and you go to someone else. Same with the ministry. If people just don't want to come and serve with you, if they don't want to be in unity, you, you can't force them because they don't want it. All you can do is work with the ones that do and build upon that. He will not brawl. He will not argue, which represents a different way of bringing out a servant's quiet approach, right? Because a servant doesn't do that. A servant just serves. Nor will he shout, carries on with 
the same idea over and over and over again. He will do his work quietly, making no loud claims to underline his importance. How important it is. Boy, have we had few people like that here. How important I am for this ministry. The Lord's work will be done without noise and publicity. He says in verse 20, a bruised reed he will not break. But what is a reed and then a bruised reed? Uh, the emphasis here is on his kindness as a servant to those who are downtrodden or weak. You know, those who are broken, those who are going through things, uh, those who are having heartaches. Jesus will work in gentleness. Uh, that's an area that we need to work on. Husbands need to work on being gentle uh, with their wives. Uh, I need work on that area. Jesus was gentle as a servant. A reed might be used for for pretty much anything. Uh, they grew all over the place. You can use them for a flute. You can make a measuring rod. You can turn them into pins. They were just uh, in well demand and very cheap to get. And, and they were so well in demand that if you broke them, you just discarded them. Just get another one. And, and what Matthew is saying here is that Jesus did not discard a bruised reed even. He cared about that bruised reed. He was concerned about those who were shattered, those who were broken. Take time to pray. Take time to hug. Take time to just let them know that you're there. You know, sometimes just letting them know you're there is enough. Sometimes, you know, we think that we can give them some scriptures or our life experiences or tell them it's going to be okay. And they don't really want to hear that. They don't want to hear that. They just want you to be there for them. Just being there and hugging them and just saying, I'm here. Whatever you need, you just let me know. That should be the thing that uh, emphasizes the Christianity in us because it did Jesus Christ. And a smoking flax he will not quench. In the Hebrew, literally a dim burning wick he will not quench. So like a candle and the wick that's coming to an end, it starts to get dim. He won't just turn it out. He won't snuff it out. He's concerned about those who are just about ready to die, that we encourage them that we pray for them. Don't just throw them away. And he says, till he sends forth justice to victory. When Jesus died on the cross, that was our victory. When he resurrected, that was our hope. See, that is our hope as believers, that this place that we live now is just a journey for us. And it's a difficult one. It's one that we need to learn how to live our Christian life. But once this life and journey is over, we're in the presence of God Almighty. That is our hope, and that is our focus, because Jesus has given us victory in the cross of Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes on that cross. Don't take your eyes off of that. No matter what situation is going on in your life, even if it's within the church, keep your eyes on Jesus. You serve him, and don't serve anyone else. He ends with verse 21. And in his name, Gentiles will trust. Thank God for that, that Gentiles have come to know of Jesus Christ, which I am a Gentile. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all have sinned. We all have done things that are not pleasing to God. In fact, you may be doing things right now that are not pleasing to God. You know what they are. I may not know, and your neighbor may not know, but you know what you are doing. There is no one who is innocent when it comes to God. In Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The punishment that we have earned for our sins, the Bible says, is death. Not just physical death, but spiritual death. If we do not cover our sins, there is a spiritual death coming. Yes, you will die physically. You will be buried in the ground, but your soul will go either to heaven or it will be going to hell. You will die spiritually. Romans 6.23 says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God has given us a gift. It is a free gift. And it is to all humanity if they will receive it. Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. 
even while we were sinning, makes no sense to me. While I was sinning, God came down and he began to minister to me because he loved me enough that he died for me even in my sins. Jesus died for us. Jesus' death paid the price of our sins. Jesus' resurrection proved that God accepted Jesus' death as the payment for our sins. In essence, what Jesus was saying, I am going to spare you from a life of eternal damnation. That is the emphasis and the point of all this. Eternal life of damnation. We're only here for a season, ladies and gentlemen. Our eternal state is what Jesus is concerned about. So he took our place upon that Christ. And the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Because of Jesus' death on our behalf, all we have to do is believe in him. Like Abraham, he believed God and it was accounted to him as righteous. He trusted God. We need to believe that God sent his son and his death on the cross was enough to save us. I know some of you may have said this prayer many years ago. And maybe you said it for the wrong reasons. Maybe you've never said the prayer. And I want to give you that opportunity right now as we're about to close. I want you to bow your head. And this is between you and the Lord. I, I don't want publicity. I don't want you to stand up and, and raise your hand or anything. I want you right now just to get into the presence of the Lord through the Holy Spirit. And I want you to say this simple prayer. And you say it from your heart. And if you don't mean it, then don't say it. If you don't want change, then don't say it. If you don't want to serve the Lord, then don't say this prayer. If you don't want to surrender your life, empty your, empty your life of you, don't say this prayer because this is what it requires to have eternal life. It's for you to say, Lord, I want to believe what your son has done and give you my life. So say this prayer if you really want the Lord. Lord, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. I believe that he came and died to pay the penalty for the sins I committed. I ask you to forgive me and to give me the gift of eternal life you promised. Come into my life and give me a new beginning with you. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray.